Let's get started. Um, my name is Michael McFall. I'm the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Um, this is a tremendous honor to have you here in our building and on our campus. Uh, we have had some presidents before. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had uh, President Dilvis from Estonia has spoken here. Uh, President uh, Bush has spoken here. President Obama has spoken here. And now President Tikhonovsky has, has spoken here. Uh, I'm saying that on purpose. Uh, it's a real honor to have you uh, in that list. Um, we, uh, I, everybody knows who you are here. Uh, so I'm not, I have a long introduction. Everybody in this room knows who you are. Uh, for those watching um, on video, uh, we're honored to have you with us as well. Uh, this is our first hybrid event since March of 2020, just so you know. The very first time we've ever had physical people in this room. Um, uh, we're in a period of uh, flux here in Santa Clara County, as you know, as we talked about last night. Um, and therefore we have our guests here in person, but we also have online. Hello everyone, Zdrasvati. Uh, sorry that I only speak Russian and not Belarusian, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we welcome you. Uh, towards the end of our program, we will try to take some questions from the video audience, but, but bear in mind that they are with us as well. Um, this event, as we agreed, is going to be different. Um, uh, our guest, President Tikhonovska, has given many, many talks in her visit here to the United States. Uh, she's given, done lots of Q&A and press conferences, so we agreed to give her a break from that here in California, uh, so that you do not have to perform for the entire hour, uh, because she and her delegation, and we have many of her delegation, uh, her, her team here with us from Lithuania, it's been fantastic to have them all here. And over the course of the hour, I want you all to introduce yourselves when you speak. So the, the I was gonna say the Americans, we're a mixed group here, but the, the Stanford uh, community people that are here, so we know who you are. But we decided instead of just having you perform again, to try to have more of a discussion. Um, we, uh, from the Stanford community, we want to learn more about what is happening in Belarus and what you are doing uh, uh, from your uh, exile governments in Lithuania. And I heard from you, uh, we, we met last night, we talked about this, that you want to learn more about other countries and autocracies, resilience, how they change, democratic transitions. And you should know that in this room right here, we have lots of expertise in that. So I wanna make sure, I'm gonna give you the microphone first um, for some introductory remarks, but then I wanna make sure that you get to ask questions that you wanna ask. And for others here in the discussion, please feel free to ask uh, our guests, because I wanna make this a round table discussion, uh, questions you might have, but I want to open the uh, possibility that you might make some remarks and some comparative things about those kinds of questions that I just outlined. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work and we'll just, you know, we'll just move on and we'll go back to a press conference because I'm sure we could ask you many, many questions. Um, uh, we could take all of our time to do that. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Madam President. Thank you so much. Uh that you take care about me and you want other to speak and I have a little bit of rest. <laughs> but anyway, I'm uh, uh, really grateful for this opportunity to meet with uh, such uh, distinguished experts uh, on international affairs uh, to discuss uh, the crisis in Belarus and uh, to share your and our views on the ways to resolve it. And the, the resolution of this crisis uh, would benefit from your expertise and your advice on what democratic forces can do better or maybe differently, uh, both internally and uh, internationally. Many thanks to Stanford University for hosting this uh, timely discussion. Uh, just a little bit to update, uh, more than a year ago, Almost a year ago, uh, millions of Belarusians demanded, uh, de demanded that their voices are heard and that free and fair elections in Belarus finally take place. But Lukashenko uh, dismissed uh, this demand and responded with the violence and repressions that continue uh, until today. Since then, uh, more than 36,000 people have been detained. Thousands uh, were tortured in Belarus, uh, at least 10 died, 
and uh, at the moment uh, it's 597 political prisoners in Belarus. And this number is growing from day to day. Yesterday it was 584. So every day we have uh, almost 10 uh, new political prisoners. And notably that not a single case was initiated against officials uh, or right policemen uh, who tortured people, who killed people uh, in Belarus. So, you know, it's, uh, it's absolute lawlessness. Law Lawlessness? lawlessness in our country. But despite this terror, despite all the violence and repressions in Belarus, uh, our wonderful people continue to fight. Uh, undergroundly, we are trying to build structures in Belarus and uh, 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 our, for example, our workers uh, from enterprises organizing uh, striking committees and preparing for national wide strike. Our volunteers uh, uh, print in Samizdat news, newspapers and widespread them to the regions that are lack of internet or villages just to give uh, information to uh, people because the uh, regime is uh, ruining everything on the ground. He, they are ruining uh, mass media, different NGOs that have been uh, working in Belarus for many, many years. They just want people to uh, shut up as it was done uh, uh, many times before. And we uh, are collaborating with more than 40 initiatives uh, on the ground. Uh, they, these are different initiatives helping political prisoners, their relatives, uh, helping to widespread information on in internet, you know, many, many, many different, those who are, who are helping to look for a uh, new job for those who were fired because of their political views and many others. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say that I have uh, a lot of meetings uh, with the, uh, in Europe, in European Union countries, and we really, you know, uh, grateful for, uh, you know, the, for the position uh, of democratic countries that uh, since, since the beginning, since the fraudulent elections, uh, didn't recognize Lukashenko as legitimate president. And it was a very strong message for Belarusians that we are not alone uh, and uh, gave us inspiration uh, to continue our fight. And, uh, you know, this is uh, happening until now. But we are in the USA now, and uh, it, was, it is my first visit in the USA. We communicated with, uh, my team communicated with uh, some representatives of the USA, you know, earlier. It was constant dialogue, and Julia Fisher, the ambassador to Minsk, who, who wasn't allowed in very um, you know, close contact with us. And uh, I visited Washington, and... Uh, uh, I honored to have meetings with on the highest level uh, there. Uh, I met with President Biden. Uh, I met uh, with Secretary, Secretary Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and USAID Administrator Samantha Power. Uh, also, uh, caucus uh, was created, caucus of Friends of Belarus was created in, uh, uh, in the House, and the same caucus is going to be created in the Senate as well. So we have bipartisan support here. And overall, uh, we think that Belarus unites because in every country, we meet absolutely solidarity, absolute consensus about Belarus. It's understandable what is black, what is white, and parties uh, are united, and countries and people uh, work to, uh, you know, together to somehow to help Belarus. Uh, in New York, uh, our focus was on the United Nations, uh, and in series of meetings, uh, I met with the heads. Uh, of missions from Eastern and Central Europe, uh, EU 27 delegations, as well as with the P3 group, US, UK, and France. And that was joined by Estonia, Ireland, and Norway. And uh, now we understand that we are in very difficult uh, situation because uh, regime is escalating violence on the one hand. On the other, people are not uh, giving up. They are continuing to protest undergroundly. We organize, we can't go for huge demonstrations as it was in August, September, October, because, uh, you know, the, the price for, uh, you know, for, for this uh, 
Virasla increased a lot, you know, huge, uh, huge fees. Fines. Fines, H huge fines, uh, a lot of days, uh, months in prison. Uh, we have to uh, save our people. We have to save our activists. And this is our task, continue our fight without too much risk for, for people. And um, uh, Belarusians are doing their homework if I may say so, but of course we understand that we need uh, assistance and help of other democratic countries. And of course the USA, we see the USA as the champions uh, in, in uh, this help because uh, uh, you know the position of the USA is to promote democracy so all over the world. And now, uh, yes, you know, this battle now in Belarus, but it, um, it relates not only to Belarusians, but uh, to you know, all the countries because we share uh, common values. And uh, again, thank you for this meeting. And maybe I, you are such, uh, you know, uh, distinguished experts. I would like to you to share with us how you see the situation in Belarus. How, how do you think our next steps should be? Because we fighting inside, we are putting, we are asking to put to create multiple points of pressure on Lukashenko's regime to make him change his behavior. Uh, we're trying to um, attract assistance to Belarusians uh, who are fighting, uh, but you know, we processes are going on, but maybe you see different way out. Maybe you have a, a special advice to us. I don't know, I, I, I'm really honored to be here and uh, open for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. So the floor is open. We're going to use Stanford traditions, which is if you have a question or comment, uh, if you could go like that. Uh, Larry Diamond's about to do it right now. So we'll start with him. Uh, I would just ask before you ask your question or make your comment, if you could just briefly introduce yourself so all of our guests <laughs> know who they're speaking to. So uh, Larry Diamond. Uh, well, I had a chance to do that previously, but uh, again, I'm Larry Diamond. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. So um, I have two uh, suggestions and would love your reaction. The first is, um, it really does seem that a key part of your struggle now is an information struggle uh, for the consciousness, the awareness of the Belarusian citizens. For example, uh, you've spoken about the way that Russian oligarchs are gobbling up your economy. To what extent do your citizens know that and know the details of that? It would seem to be something that would be very undermining of President Lukashenko's whatever remaining legitimacy he has. So I'm wondering how you're getting your story out and what creatively could be done, you know, for a time, uh, the um, when there was a government with resolve in South Korea, they were sending uh, and civil society organizations, North Korean refugees, were sending balloons across the border to North Korea that would fall down with information for the most isolated people in the world. The other um, suggestion I would make, I'm sure you're already doing it, is that you're in exile anyway. You don't know how long this is going to struggle is going to be. And so as much as possible, I would recommend you use the time to study not only other um, democratic transitions, but post transitions. And um, one of the things that struck me in hearing about your story and the coming together of the diverse and often fractious elements of your opposition behind your candidacy for president uh, is that this is, this is the only way to prevail in a transition when the opposition unites. But if you hold new elections soon and several different candidates run against one another, you know, if Lukashenko has 35% of the vote remaining, he might be elected again in a free and fair election. If you don't have uh, rules that, you know, for example, with preferential voting, ensure that a democratic option prevails, or if you don't do what the Chileans did after their transition and unite the entire democratic opposition for a period of time, one electoral cycle, two electoral cycles behind a common ticket again. Interesting. Do you, do you want to respond or do you want to keep asking other questions or back and forth? And, and, and I want to now invite all of our Belarusian uh, visitors to also, if they want to chime in as well. 
I mean, I would just say while uh, the, the amazing, so as we talked about uh, last night, I have, uh, and many in the people in this room have studied other transitions and um, uh, uniting the opposition is always a central challenge, right? It was in Serbia in 2000, Georgia 2003, Ukraine in 2004, uh, Egypt, uh, you can think of a lot of cases. It's quite remarkable how you did that. Um, I'd be eager to hear more about how you did that, frankly, um, just the history of that. And are there lessons uh, about how you did it initially behind your candidacy that might help to keep the opposition together? But I also wanna make sure other people speak and but over to you, Madam President, first. So how we did it, uh, we, uh, we united, that we, we, right. we united, yes. Uh, I understand that, you know, at the beginning, uh, uh, I stepped uh, instead of my husband and my husband had his... Uh, um, Constituency? Oh, no, uh, supporters, thank you. His supporters, Viktor Babalika had his, uh, you know, uh, some spheres that uh, uh, liked him, Valery Tsipkala also. And uh, when they, they uh, were jailed or uh, sent out of the country, you know, I, I was the only one who was registered. And it was very useful, uh, wise uh, decision of true women to unite. We united everybody. And we united not about uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, around Svetlana Tikhanovska's future president or, or future leader, but about values. There were three uh, points in our strategy that uh, haven't changed uh, at all since that day is release of all political prisoners, uh, constitutional reform, and new free and fair elections. We, it's three points of our program, nothing about economic changes, nothing about uh, uh, education or, uh, or healthcare uh, sphere, only three points, and this is still so. And uh, you're right that we have to think about post-transition. We understand that we are in uh, the process of fighting now, in process of revolution, but uh, we have to uh, think about uh, future Belarus and future very serious and uh, think very seriously because uh, now uh, regime is destroying everything in Belarus and we uh, will have to restore um, and bring something new. And, uh, you know, this post we want negotiations with uh, with regime uh, during which we have to discuss a transition period when will when new elections will take place, but to avoid chaos uh, in this transition period, we need uh, some specialists and experts and uh, uh, you know who who will understand how, how to act because uh, it's very important not to lose control and and the people. Um, yeah, I'll pick up from here. Um, something that we've been preparing for. Larry, can you introduce yourself? Partly because I'm thinking of our uh, virtual audience as well. Just thank you, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Valery Kavalevsky. I'm head of the cabinet and Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya's team, and uh, I lead also on the international affairs. Uh, something we've been doing for uh, kind of for the future and to prepare for, for the change in Belarus is the reconciliation uh, measures, uh, kind of what to do when the change comes. We would like this transition to be peaceful and would like to start uh, from, uh, uh, from, from the effort to reconcile and to build the country together. And we've had consultations with some experts, including Rolf Meyer, uh, chief negotiator to end apartheid uh, in South Africa, and we'll continue this, uh, this conversation further. Uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovska also contributed to the development of, um, of a comprehensive plan of investments uh, of the European Union uh, to a democratic Belarus, uh, something that sort of bridges uh, today and the future over overlooking essentially Lukashenko, uh, because uh, Belarus can be democratic and prosperous only when Lukashenko is gone. Uh, so EU has sent a very strong signal uh, that this plan is for the democratic Belarus, for Belarusians who, uh, who live in a different uh, country and uh, we also send this message to other countries, United States in particular, UK, Canada, uh, they can develop similar plans. Uh, again, this is a commitment. Uh, at this point of time, uh, this, is, uh, this is a political move that kind of reinforces hope among Belarusians uh, that they are not alone, that when the change comes, they, they will have friends by their side uh, to overcome uh, the, the challenges of the transition period. 
Um, speaking about Russia and uh, its intentions, uh, quite clear intentions to uh, exercise stronger control over Belarus and probably to buy out some of the state-owned enterprises. Uh, this is not a very transparent topic uh, in Belarus. There, there are a number of meetings of Putin and Lukashenko, but we have very little information about the outcomes, about the topics they discussed. It is very, very kind of strictly uh, regulated what we know about this. And this has been a feature of uh, foreign policy of Lukashenko that uh, Belarusians, ordinary Belarusians, have, don't have much information about what's going on. And normally, uh, this is the case for foreign policy. Many issues are discussed behind closed doors, and this is normal. But very often, even Western governments follow the suit. They, they sort of uh, acquiesce to the uh, demands of Lukashenko and uh, uh, decline to share much information. And so this lack of transparency in foreign policy dialogue uh, this is to the advantage of, of the dictatorship, not to the people of Belarus. So uh, we, we would call on the governments uh, to, be, uh, to be more thoughtful uh, about this, to, to communicate in a more clear language uh, to Belarusians about uh, any kinds of conversation they have, uh, especially now when, uh, when, this, when this danger of uh, uh, closed door uh, back channels, uh, essentially to discuss uh, issues like release of political prisoners, what can be traded uh, in in this uh, in return to this? Uh, it is very very sensitive. Uh, it is it can uh, create a different dynamic that would help Lukashenko, but not Belarusian people. Thank you. Thank you. Just my ambassador, may uh, I ask a question? You know, uh, on one of the meeting with Despera, I was asked a question. For example, let's pretend that uh, Lukashenko is gone one day. We don't know what happens, just he disappeared. And what, what difficulties uh, will we meet next day? How, what can be the scenarios of, of uh, next uh, weeks? How do you see this? You're experts on, on transition, uh, and, uh, on transition traditions, yeah. And you know, how, how should we act then? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who are in exile, uh, a, a lot of leaders in jail, you know, what are the first steps? That's a great question. Uh, I welcome my colleagues to try to uh, answer it. Uh, John, please. Uh, um, I have a question about Habarovsk I'll come back uh, to in Russia, because uh, as you know, the demonstrations in Habarovsk broke out one month before your, your, your Belarusian ones did. And I'm interested in the way in which those two demonstrations influenced each other. What did you learn from Habarovs? What did Habarovs learn from you? They were clearly, um, they were always mentioning each other during the demonstrations. I can answer. I don't oh. know if should, I should do this. I'm Franek, <laughs> I'm Franek Kachurk, I'm advisor to Svetlana Tsikhanovska. Uh, uh, so I think uh, there was connection, uh, psychological primarily, and uh, these uh, two protest movements in Khabarovsk mm -hmm. and in Minsk, uh, they were sending messages to each other. Yes. They were like, Khabarovsk, we are with you on the yes. posters of Belarus protests, and Khabarovsk sent a message from other side of the continent to Belarusians, we are with you. And always you could see Belarusian white, red, white flags in Khabarovsk. Uh, this is because the information space is um, uh, global right now, and uh, many websites, Telegram channels, YouTube channels, people in Russia and Belarus, Ukraine uh, are watching are the same. Uh, for example, organizations such as uh, Dost TV Rain yes. or Current Time TV, they were covering the same time protests in Belarus, protests in Russia and other countries as well. But, you know, it also helped, you know, to interconnect, you know, and to build this connection. To say that these uh, protests were interdependent or interconnected uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do this. Uh, I think they have different nature, different context, and protests in Belarus are sparked by um, rigged elections because Slanskanovska won at these elections, and protests were about defending their choice. Majority protested for their votes. In Russia, uh, there was no election that uh, opposition in Russia won. Of course, there are no democratic elections in Russia. We know that, but this is the biggest difference. So in Russia, it's still opposition protests, I would say. And in Belarus, it was the majority protecting its, its rights. Um, we were trying to, uh, to, to, to learn from other parts of the world, from Hong Kong, for example, especially in terms of 
uh, tactics, you know, and to see how they do this. We were using same applications um, on, on smartphones, you know, this which doesn't need internet, especially when shut down, internet was shut down, you know, to help to, inter to connect to each other. Uh, but uh, it's, and also we're trying to learn from Gene Sharp and other books, but they were not very helpful because Belarusians invented twice more new practices, you know, of nonviolent resistance. And when we checked the book, we found out that all these um, tools and ways of protest we already, we already tried and even invented uh, more. So it's, it's quite a uh, technologically driven revolution. Uh, with a big accent on nonviolent resistance, um, uh, which which uh, helped to to engage absolutely new social groups thanks to social media and um, and technologies. Uh, if, I, if I could, I apologize. Uh, yeah, if I could add very briefly a perspective on what what started the protests in Belarus. Uh, the context was that uh, the the entire campaign, presidential campaign, was very different. And uh, first, it was Sergei Tikhanovsky who sort of electrified the field, uh, and people responded to, with a lot of interest. Uh, then Viktor Babarika and Valery Tsepkala joined the team. Uh, but uh, people saw very clear alternatives. Uh, kind of, they became very hopeful that they would see a possibility of competition of different ideas, different candidates. For quite a while, Belarusians could not see these uh, viable alternatives to Lukashenko, and suddenly they saw it, and there's like. Wow, this is this is very interesting. They became very enthusiastic about uh, the whole competition idea, and suddenly this uh, this hope was taken away from them. Uh, something that they could kind of finally uh, take part in choosing their next leader and uh, uh, who would decide on the future on their behalf. So it was not about the technicality of rigged elections per se. It was about the hope that was taken away from them again. To say something as yeah, well. just just wanted to for you to translate for me or for those who understand Russian that uh, it's about Khabarovsk. We had such a saying at Khabarovsk, the Bresta dictatory nietu mesta, and we were shouting. <laughs> just translate for. Oh, that's too hard. Franek, help me out. <laughs> From Khabarovsk to Brest, Western Belarus city, there is no place for dictatorship. It's, right. It's, it sounds, you know. It sounds cool. yeah. <laughs> melodic. Yeah, that's a great phrase. Um, so. Uh, Frank, I saw you next, and then we'll come around to Tanya, and then Anna, and then Eric. Uh, so I wanted to try to answer a president. Uh, and I just want to interrupt, oh. just to introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Just I'm, so I'm, I'm thinking of our virtual audience all the time. I'm uh, Francis Fukuyama. I'm the director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law here at FSI. So I wanted to try to answer President Sikonuska's uh, question about what's the first thing you do uh, I think that the biggest problem that any transition to a more democratic regime uh, uh, faces is how to operate the state. Because if you can't operate the state, you can't deliver services, you can't teach children, you can't do public health. Uh, and I think there have been a lot of big pitfalls in uh, understanding how the state works and then how to control uh, that state. There's a temptation to you know, dismantle part of it because you don't trust the people that have been working there for generations. Uh, the biggest mistake in that regard was what the United States did in Iraq after the invasion of dismantling the army, uh, which, you know, led to the subsequent uh, uh, collapse of order. Uh, and I think that, you know, any transition is going to have to rely on the old regime to a very large extent because they're the ones that actually know you know, how to collect taxes and pay bills and, and so forth. Uh, and I think that one of the things that's very critical to do before the transition is to understand that mechanism. And, you know, presumably you have a lot of supporters among the bureaucrats, right, that run the, the, the mechanism. So you need to identify who they are and who is likely to be loyal to you. And you have to rely on them. Uh, and, you know, you can't expect to bring from outside, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the competent cadres that can actually understand how that state mechanism works. And that's something you can prepare for. There's one really interesting little known fact, you know, that after the um, defeat of Nazi Germany, there was an attempt at a kind of immediate lustration uh, or denazification. Uh, and it turned out that it was very difficult to do because it was really these Nazis that understood how the German state operated. 
And so the occupation authorities found themselves in this awkward position where they actually had to call back a lot of Nazi party members to actually make the government work. And I believe Norman may correct me on this, but I believe that in the end, only about a thousand uh, Nazis were actually um, lustrated or, or kicked out of the state service because of that dependence on you know, the existing regime. So it's something that I think every transition has to confront, but it's something you can prepare for, I think, uh, in advance. Thanks, Frank. Uh, is this your are the comments on the same question or something different? Or? I was going to comment on, on what Frank just said. Or so so why don't we go this way then? You know, just keep the thread going. So. Thank you. I'm Anna Grzmabs. I'm um, a professor of political science here and the director of the Europe Center. Um, and, you know, as a political scientist, when I look at other transitions, I think the number one mistake that other post-communist transitions made is to make the focus about outcomes rather than processes. Mm -hmm. And so people, you know, have been promised prosperity and, you know, full freedom and just, you know, basically life in Sweden. Um, and no sort of post-transition government can achieve that right away. So at least the research that I've seen suggests that we ought to be focusing instead of the process, right? So free and fair elections, the rule of law, rather than retaliation or purging the state administration. In the economic sphere, property rights and transparency rather than instant prosperity or you know, instant efficiency, which is basically not possible. Um, and in the societal sphere, I think the biggest mistake that's been made in the past is to focus on the winners rather than the losers. The winners are out there, they're visible, they're the success stories, but the people who are left behind are often those who then support a sort of authoritarian backlash against the new democracy. Um, and so I think making the, making the transition about processes rather than specific outcomes and ensuring that people can participate and be heard in those processes um, is more likely to ensure success. Terrific. And we'll get you some of her research that she's written about these uh, issues in the post-communist world from Professor Jamal Abu. So I'm taking notes of all the things I need to gather from you from last Thank night you. and today, okay? Tanya and Eric, is this the same thread or different? You're gonna pivot off. So why don't we go to Eric next on this thread and then Tanya will come to you on a different topic. Okay. So I'm straining to say it's uh, the, the same thread, but I'm Eric Jensen. I'm on the law faculty at uh, the law school here at Stanford and uh, core faculty of the Center on Democracy Development Rule of Law. Um, I thought I'd ask you something that I actually know something about and, uh, and maybe caution a bit too. Uh, one of your prongs of reform is constitutional reform, and I understand why that is, uh, not least of which is term limits on the president, but many other things. I had the opportunity last night to review your uh, 1994 constitution, and it's pretty good. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a good working draft, and so my, my uh, comment is uh, you've got the benefit of a united uh, opposition. Uh, take advantage of that as soon as possible uh, when you come back to power. And I would not open the aperture of constitutional reform uh, too wide. I'd do a deal as quickly as possible to take advantage of the, the unification that you enjoy right now. I'm reminded of uh, Nepal, which uh, drafted a constitution that I was in, involved in for a while and then just decided it was a useless activity, where there was endless, uh, an endless sense of participation. And every micro um, group was advocating for having it, its group mentioned in the constitution. There was no hope of ever reaching a constitutional deal until an earthquake struck in Nepal and suddenly a really big earthquake and suddenly uh, the opposition came together and they united and they passed a constitution. So uh, my recommendation is don't open the aperture of constitutional debate too wide. If you've got a good working draft, uh, think about ways that you might want to fine tune it uh, but don't stray too much from uh, a time when there was consensus. Yeah, thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, when I talked about three points of our uh, program, uh, it was like release of political prisoners and new elections. Uh, the second one was, wasn't amend, amendments in constitution, it was returning to constitution 1994, mm -hmm. because it was good. Uh, the uh, problem is that it has never fulfilled. You know, and uh, now Lukashenko is uh, uh, talking about amendments in constitution, constitutional reforms, and you know, if it's he amended constitution many times, but the problem is that 
you know, it, it doesn't work because of uh, the government. And uh, uh, I, I understand that we will need, uh, uh, we are talking about new constitution, but as you said, the frame, you know, the, the base of the constitution is fine. Just uh, the debates in Belarus are about some, uh, uh, some uh, details about language, uh, about... Uh, um, some details of uh, uh, state functioning. Yes, of state functioning. And uh, so we, and, and you know, what is uh, important about Belarus that for so many years, people were not involved in, uh, in, uh, po in politics in Belarus. Uh, not many people pay too much attention to constitutional reforms, you know, constitution, constitutional reform, I think it like doesn't unite people. They, right. People can't be united uh, around constitution because it's something, you know, very far away. Uh, but we have to work on, on, on this for sure, but it's not, uh, uh, you know, it's not up to one person to decide what will be the points of constitution. It's up to people. I intend to add. Great. Uh, that, thank you for that. Um, so I, I have Tanya next, then David Holloway, uh, Catherine Stoner, and Professor Neymar. Although, professor, 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 but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, or Catherine, David, and Norm. But uh, Tanya, first, please. Yes, hi, I'm Tanya Baiva. I'm not a professor. Um, I'm um, a resident, um, so part uh, of uh, local Belarusian diaspora here in the Bay Area. Very honored to be here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, I wanted to respond uh, to a point raised by John about similarity or dissimilarity about the protests because I think it's important. Um, so in my view, I think the protests are related. And I think um, in a way that um, protest in Khabarovsk gives courage to people, uh, to, to the protest um, you know, in Belarus and vice versa, right? I think through uh, both people of Russia and people of Belarus are fighting the fear and fighting the notion that there is this one guy who controls everything, right? So by um, coming out to the streets in mass, people finally like, started realizing, ha, huh, it's up to us. It's up to my individual, you know, willpower to, to make a difference. So I think, and I think that's what scares the autocrats of this world, right? That people will realize that, ha, huh, that's, you know, the king is naked, right? That it's up to us, to me. And if a lot of us, we actually, you know, can uh, take down, uh, you know, the big guy. So I think uh, protests anywhere in Russia, protests anywhere in Belarus, they're very helpful for democratization of either um, kind of either society. So I think they are somewhat related. And I also wanted to add, if I may, to um, Eric's observation about the 1994 constitution. So I think one error made in that constitution, which is fundamental, is structuring Belarus as the uh, presidential versus parliamentary system. Because I don't think in 1994 Belarus was had institutions, uh, you know, to oversee the um, proper separation of powers, right? I mean, in the U.S. here we also struggle sometimes with this issue, where we have a very strong executive, right? In Belarus, <laughs> that that was an issue that the country as part of the Soviet Union was governed by the party, and then transferring all this power to a president led to the consequences we are facing. So I think if we can make one difference to the constitution. Of 1994, for me, my vote would be to change to the parliamentary system. Thank you, uh, David. Yes, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, President Tichonovsky, for coming here. I have a question and then a comment. And in your remarks, you talked about reconciliation uh, and the need for met measures of reconciliation. And I'm very interested to know who it is you need to reconcile with, who, who needs to be involved in reconciliation, how you conceive of the people who need to have reconciliation take place. Um, uh, and I think there may be two, two elements to that. Uh, the most important is clearly the people in Belarus, but Belarus as we know external factors are also very important. And I'm not sure reconciliation is the right word there, but gaining acceptance and legitimacy internationally, that's an important issue. Um, I have not worked on transitions, but I've worked somewhat on negotiation. And one of the, the key issues, and it relates back to something that Anna said earlier, 
um, the key, one of the key issues is to make sure that uh, if you are bringing a conflict to an end, even if not everyone likes the outcome, at least they think there is still a place for them in that outcome. In other words, it doesn't have to be a shared vision of the future. You may have people who have different visions of the future, but there has to be some vision of a shared future that, yes, I can live with this, it's tolerable. And so you don't want people who feel, oh, we, were, we lost, we were totally done by. So I'm sorry, it's a long um, <laughs> comment, but I think the, the question is, who needs to be reconciled? Yeah, thank you, because uh, not many people in reality know about this idea of reconciliation that was proposed by our Coordination Council. Uh, and um, we, we uh, you know, discuss in this a lot, but uh, Flanak will tell you. Yeah, the, the, the basic idea is uh, that those who are not guilty in uh, human rights, uh, crimes, abuses, uh, and uh, that they will uh, uh, be able to continue their work, you know, for free Belarus. Why this reconciliation problem was raised? Because last fall, during the protests, uh, there was such a <coughs> message seeded by uh, propaganda that all of them, when they will come to power, they will fire you, they will lose their your jobs, you're not needed. And many people who are in nomenclatura for so many years, uh, they didn't see the sense in all of these changes. And this is why the process of uh, defecting or leaving, quitting the system was slowed down. And then we changed the strategy. And instead of forcing them to leave the system, we asked them to prepare for this moment of change, to support, to do at least something being in their places. Because Lukashenko's system in less than years is composed mostly uh, by of technocrats. Uh, before, the like, perhaps from 94 to 2010, he was picking the people and putting them on minister, ministerial position. But after 2005 and 10, he already did not have time and understanding whom to pick on what position. So he just trusted technocrats. And most of the ministers, except the uh, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, uh, they made a career you know, from the university, working in uh, profile ministry, then vice minister, then minister. And we are trying to show them that, you know, without, after Lukashenko, they will continue their work. This is what the Mr. Fukuyama mentioned, you know, yeah. just to see the future. But it doesn't uh, relate to those who commit crimes, because, you know, we shouldn't allow impunity to, to, to happen. Because right now, Lukashenko delegated uh, unlimited uh, uh, power to some groups, criminal, of criminal police particularly, who can detain people, arrest and torture people without any consequences. So these groups, uh, they must be brought to justice, of course. And people must know that these groups will be brought to justice. Yeah, so like heavy crimes, no crazy crimes. If I, if I may just briefly add here, uh, my name is Hanna Libakova. I'm a journalist and non-resident fellow of the Atlantic Council. So basically there are people who share our values, democracy, uh, law, all of this, you know, human rights. Um, and there are people who do not share them. So kind of, there is a question how to find a common ground between the kind of those two groups. And because the field is kind of getting so polarized because we don't have channels of communication with them, um, people who are kind of, who do not share our values, they, we solidarize between ourselves and they also solidarize. And we cannot kind of break this wall at this stage. So this is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's why I also kind of feel that it's very important to find, you know, a um, a chance for us to to communicate and uh, to to break the, this wall and kind of not to allow us to be so polarized. You should know, of course, your country is not the only country struggling with polarization between Democrats and autocrats. Of course. Uh, just, uh, of course. Uh, and we should all learn from each other on that front. But I have some questions from our virtual audience, mm -hmm. and I think it's only fair that we include them. So I'm going to include them at, in about 10 minutes time. But for now, we're going to go around everybody's placard that was up, including Catherine, you're I'm coming I'll to you. It. I'll try to be fast. Well, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everybody to make brief comments, gather them all together, and have you respond if you want. 
and then we'll go to our virtual audience and then we'll be and done. Do you have time then to go around? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we show. Yeah, to deal. Um, so let's let's start with that. Next, I, I had. Uh, uh, yeah, I think Catherine, you were next. Yeah. Okay. Catherine, then Norman, and then we'll get the other three, and then we'll have, let you to respond. Uh, but I just want everybody, if you could be brief, uh, given the limitations of our time. So uh, uh, we met last night. I'm Catherine Stoner. I'm a senior fellow here, uh, and I work on Russia, but also. I've written some things on transitions too. So one thing I guess is to look to answer your question earlier of, of you know what, what would what would you do coming out of the square after the revolution is over and Lukashenko's gone. So um, Amr can better comment on Egypt and what went right and what went wrong there, but certainly not the outcome that was desired, right? So this is the big moment. So just you know obviously Frank made the point about governance, which I think is a really important one, right? You have to demonstrate that your system is going to be better than what was. And I think getting caught up too much in um, a constitutional convention where uh, you know, people can't eat constitutions, right? So they care to a great degree, but you know, not months and months of, of uh, politicians um, uh, basically yelling at one another. So um, to the extent that can, those principles can be put in place ahead of time. Um, you mentioned last night a really interesting point about democracy's responsibility. And it is responsibility of citizens to participate, but it's also the responsibility of those who are elected to, to govern, right? And, and also to a process, a commitment to a process. So having you know, law, rule of law, when you think of, of countries that tried to do too much all at the same time, I mean, Russia failed massively in the 1990s in many respects, succeeded in a few others, but one of them was you know, trying to um, implement very radical changes without actually having the legal and bureaucratic institutions in place. And, and it proved to be equate democracy with all of these bad <coughs> outcomes that seemed unfair to people. So um, you know, making sure that there are institutions that can actually implement the programs that you wanna bring forward and a commitment to law and process, um, even if people won't like the outcome sometimes, just fairness and transparency, because what Lukashenko is not is fair. What he is not is transparent, right? It's corruption. Um, and I think to the extent that things have gone not so well at times in Ukraine, it's also been because of this. People don't see a, a concrete change. Um, and so um, constitutional convention, fine, make it fast um, and, and show people you can change their lives for the, the better. This is a better system that can deliver. I support, I support the parliamentary presidential, but that would make, uh, make Belarus a huge outlier um, in the world and in, in the world of transitioning countries, actually. They usually go presidential, but. Professor Neymar. Thank you, I'm Norman Neymar and Norman. in the history department and here at FSI. I just wanted to mention one dimension of this discussion that has not, not come up yet and it keeps occurring to me, which is the, the question of representing you know, Belarus and the Belarusian people. In other words, the, the notion of the, the spread of populism and nationalism, you know, is something that's quite common in the region. And there's no reason that you can't represent that and don't represent that. In other words, that, that the political reform is one part of the story. But another part of the story is the sovereignty of the country and the independence of the country and the ability of the country then to choose, for example, um, you know, being closer with the, with the EU um, rather than with Russia. And that, you know, obviously that also poses problems for a transition period. So when I was thinking when you were asking, well, what do we do during a period if there was no Lukashenko is to be very careful, you know, what's going on at the e in the East but at the same time, you know, like Ukraine, you know, you, you, you need to make it clear and you want to be clear, you know, that this is an independent country that gets to choose, you know, that gets to make its, make its own choices. You know, the Baltic has made its choices. Ukraine would like to obviously move uh, more quickly to NATO and, and, um, and to EU. But this is something that seems to me has to be on the back of your mind and would be something that's extremely important in a in any kind of transition uh, period. And you know, the notion of defending your country's sovereignty strikes me as something that's equally important in some ways to the political, you know, internal question of how you create democracy. Great, I'm gonna gather up all of them so you can respond or not respond to whatever you want to. It's, a, it's, it's your choice. Uh, Dimitra. 
So Dimitro Kio and Amr will get the last comment and then we'll go to a couple from our virtual audience. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dmitry Kushnirov, Consul General of Ukraine in San Francisco. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be uh, here today. Uh, so first of all, I'd say that Ukraine from the very beginning, I think, made a, uh, cl quite a clear position in support of a free and fair elections in Belarus. And uh, it's the importance that the voice of uh, people has to be heard and the violence against peaceful protests is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, then uh, also, it's, we believe it should be said that now for Ukraine and for Europe, it's uh, highly important that Belarus is a uh, uh, sovereign and independent state, free from and as far from as possible from Russian influence, and that Ukraine uh, remains ready to cooperate in different in all possible formats in order to, to contribute in solving the political crisis in Belarus. And the question is uh, the following. So Ukraine knows um, better than anyone, probably, uh, that it's very important to win the information war, so to say, the access to the minds of the people. Because otherwise, uh, the uh, state-controlled media and, uh, of course, Russian-controlled media are brainwashing the minds of the people in Belarus as well as they did in Ukraine before. And uh, if before, uh, social media remain probably the source of truthful information. So right now, Russia is using like uh, thousands of its uh, controlled bots to uh, win the war in, in the social media as well. So our question is, how uh, are you going to, what's your plan to about it, uh, to keep it that all the people in Belarus understand what's going on and, uh, and see the perspective that they don't lose the face in uh, democracy, they don't lose the face that eventually people uh, can win. Wow, these are tough questions. Uh, I'm glad you're answering and not me. Uh, uh, Kio and then Amr. Um... I'm Kiyo Tutsi, I'm a, a faculty member in sociology here and I do research on the efficacy of the international human rights system. Um, so my questions are about the, uh, uh, what the international community can do uh, to support uh, human rights defenders like you. And I think it's critically important for the international community and the United States to support um, proponents of democracy and uh, human rights defenders like you. Um, so in a situation, in this particular situation, it's probably going to be very difficult for the United Nations to take any concrete action because Russia can veto any kind of sanctions or uh, referral to the International Criminal Court for Lukashenko. Um, but I, I learned that um, Belarus actually has ratified almost all of the key international human rights treaties uh, with monitoring bodies. Um, and you know, those institutions do not function all that well, but there may be some hope that the international monitoring bodies like the Human Rights Committee, uh, all these bodies could do something to support your movement. And all, for the United States, I understand that you met with President Biden and, and uh, um, key personnel in Washington and asked for maximum pressure on Lukashenko. Um, I'm not sure the U US Belarus economic relations are not, not that big. So I don't know if uh, US has a lot of leverage uh, to pressure Lukashenko, um, but I'm wondering what, what more the uh, United States could do and also, um, I'm wondering if there's any kind of possible backlash um, against uh, ties with the United States. I've, I've seen a lot of countries go through these motions of getting support from the United States and, and EU, and the uh, opposition movement being portrayed as sort of puppets of the West or something like that. And Lukashenko could use it, use it that way. So if you have any concerns, um, do you have any concerns about that? Great questions. And one of them from our virtual audience uh, echoes that. Uh, so let me just add it now, is uh, how are the EU sanctions working for you? And uh, so I'm just adding it now. Amr, please. Thank you so much. My name is Amr Hamzewi. I'm a senior scholar at the Center on Democracy here at FSI. So back to your question on um, uh, what should we do next? And I'm reflecting not only on Egypt, but Egypt, Tunisia, which I guess many of you are following as of now. I guess the, the real challenge which you face the next day is, as Frank and Eric and Catherine were saying, is how to govern. And I, I'm, I'm just flagging very quickly two ideas. One is the need to start right away to build alliances within the state apparatus. Because an opposition spectrum, no matter how united it is, is bound to face cracks the next day. 
So you start discussing um, uh, constitutional reforms or even opening up to a constitutional debate, which you cannot suppress because there is an anticipation that the constitution, which is a key document in the country, will be discussed. And then you face cracks within the opposition spectrum. So one way to go about it is to try to, to, to move in the opposite direction of building alliances um, and finding allies within the state apparatus, within the state bureaucracy. And to that end, I believe that this, a discussion as symbolically and as politically and as important as from a human rights perspective on impunity is not needed. So if, and I, I'm really reflecting on mistakes which we did in Egypt and with mistakes which happened in Tunisia and are backfiring as of now. Um, as important as it is, a discussion on impunity is only bound to alienate the biggest segment within the state apparatus. And the challenge to govern is huge. And an opposition which hasn't been governing for decades will be um, pushed around to manage economic challenges, social challenges. And you're operating against a uh, sk skyrocketed set of expectation among citizens because they expect democracy and a democratic transition to improve the living standards. We know the reality is actually quite to the contrary. It's bound to, to, to deteriorate. But how to, how, to, how to do that? And the second point is, and I, I believe Norman was going in that direction with regard to nationalism, you need to figure out uh, uh, how to use a bit of populist and nationalist narratives, because you will face them. Uh, you will face any, any, any opposition to democracy and democratic transition is normally based on um, a, a, a systematic use of discourses, appealing to nationalist and populist narratives. To figure out a way of how to turn it around, to use a bit of, not anti-democratic, but use a bit of populist and nationalist narratives to convince segments which will be alienated quickly, seeing the situation on the ground not evolving the way they expected is important as well. So um, yeah, so far to the question of what comes next. Well, and we, if we had more time, we might go deeper into the case of what happened in Egypt. And, and you know, we should talk about how we might continue this dialogue with your team and other people in the future. Um, just so you know, we uh, run here at FSI, at CDDRL, a summer program called Draper Hills. Uh, I think we're in our, Frank, we're in our 16th, 16th year of this program. Uh, where we bring, and it's reminded me of it because we usually sit in this room and we haven't been in this room for two years. Uh, and we usually sit at a table just like this with people from all over the world. I just checked, I just emailed all of our Belarusian uh, alums who are thrilled that you are here today and they wanted me to let you know that. But we've had Belarusians coming for 16 years uh, in this program. And we should think about ways that we can do, continue this kind of dialogue about these these transitional issues in the future. So we'll we'll talk about that. I'm gonna add one last question from our uh, audience that has been very patient and I apologize that we're not getting to as many as I would like. Uh, and then I'm gonna let you just close in any way you want. Uh, you can answer those questions or say whatever you want. Um, uh, the question is, uh, are there, have there been uh, any discussions and negotiations with Russia? So I think there's lots of questions here about Russia maybe say a few words about how you try to handle that particular question. So, Madam President, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I will try to answer a couple of questions and then my uh, team will- Jump in. Jump in, thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, about our independency. You know, uh, at this moment, uh, I think that uh, our independency could be under threat when uh, some other countries uh, can uh, misuse weakness of regime and to, uh, uh, you know, start to to interfere into inner politics. And uh, but our independence is not for trade. Our sovereignty is the hugest values value for Belarusians, and they will continue if in, in if in case such a threat appears, uh, people will defend uh, independence. And on my every meeting with uh, all the leaders of the countries, I urge them to be uh, the grantors that uh, you know uh, we will not lose our independence and that all the deals that are uh, signed between uh, ex-president Lukashenko and any other uh, people they will be reviewed they uh, he's not legitimate he can't uh, he can't make any of these deals and um, but uh, you know you on in transition period and 
now, now our task is not to discuss with people where to go towards Russia or towards Western side or I don't know, South Australia, what, whatever. <laughs> our task now is to return people right to choose. And after this, after new elections, people will uh, choose the, the road of our country. You know, it's not our prerogative. It's not our focus now, you know, and we, you know, we fighting against a uh, dictator, uh, then, you know, choosing our way now. And this question uh, where to move now, you know, uh, about, you know, economical reforms, privatization, they will only split people and, and not unite. Uh, about propaganda, uh, journalistic, you know, uh, Russia, I think Franak will answer. Uh, about uh, UN, uh, some of the excellent question. You know, I, I understand that uh, UN can't do a lot organizing any events about Belarus, but already since August 2, uh, uh, UN uh, discussion on area formula. Uh, were organized, uh, UN uh, era, for, era formula hearings uh, were organized to be about security and journalistic um, uh, terror in Belarus. So there are possibilities to keep Belarus on the on agenda. And this is one of our also main topics and discussions with, uh, with the democratic leaders is that don't lose uh, Belarus from your attention it's very important it's uh, it uh, you know it's necessary because after this huge demonstrations in Belarus disappeared attention also disappeared and Lukashenko and his cronies uh, felt impunity and then hijacking of a flight um, uh, happened yeah and so we have to you know be sure that Belarus is at the top topics of uh, discussion on uh, in different uh, organizations uh, and events. Uh, so uh, and you, okay, I, I, will, I will try to answer about Russia and then you, you will continue. So, you know, I think that uh, Kremlin supported uh, Lukashenko after uh, elections was the fact that nobody expected such a present of people. And, uh, you know, we surprised the whole world and, and we surprised ourselves as well. And the uh, Kremlin, you know, didn't um, like prepare a lo uh, candidate loyal to Russia and uh, all that stuff. And now, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, Kremlin, it's not, it's not up to Kremlin to decide what's going on in Belarus. We understand that we have deep uh, trade relationships. They have personal relationship between ex-president and uh, President Putin, but uh, it, it, we, we don't have to put Russia and Belarus in one basket. We are absolutely separate cases. You will never be able, maybe you will never be able to solve Russian crisis, but it's about Belarus. It's not about Russia. It's not about you know uh, other countries. and. Um, so now it's uh, like Russia can't allow, though it's not up to them, but uh, you know, that uh, changes in Belarus will happen through revolution, through uprising, because the situation is in Russia also not very good. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Lukashenko is uh, becoming too costly, diplomatically and politically and economically for Kremlin. And, uh, uh, you know, our task, you know, and task of uh, democratic countries to heighten this cost for, uh, of support for, for him, for Russia. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we had, um, we tried a couple of times, you know, to, uh, to have any dialogue with Kremlin. We didn't have uh, any contacts, so they are not answering. And, you know, even on experts level, and um, but we, uh, you know, we, despite of Russia supporting Lukashenko or not, this is our uh, this is event in Belarus, and we will continue to fight despite of all the out factors. Will democratic countries support us or, or not? Will Russia support uh, um, uh, Lukashenko or not? This is our fight, and people, you know, will will, will not give up. They will continue, and. Uh, Yes. I think we are, we are out of time. 
I think that's a great note to end on, actually, uh, Madam President. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank my colleagues that uh, showed up today, and I do think we achieved our objective of having uh, this conversation, and I will work with your team that we will try to continue this uh, conversation. Um, and then secondly, um, Madam President, I just want to say I, I watched your campaign. I saw you on T because of the, the world is all global, like Franek said. So for those of us who are interested in democratic changes, it was truly inspirational what you did in your country. Uh, and it remains inspirational what you've been doing outside of your country. Uh, and it is a real honor and pleasure to have you here at Stanford today. So thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you so much.